today we'll continue to discuss the remaining portion of the agricultural production, particularly in relation to the position of the peasant in the village. And then we'll go to the village community. The peasant in medieval India had a large number of cattle. Manrik, the 17th century traveler, had found in the densely populated area of Bengal large number of cows grazing in the field. Chaitanya in his days had seen on the edge of the village hundreds of cows grazing in the field. Abul Fazal stated that there was a tax on the domestic animal, but he exempted, according to the government order, two cows, four bullocks and one buffalo from the tax. In Bengal, however, we do not find any reference to tax, but it seems that it was prevalent in northern India. As a result of this large number of cattle, milk and milk products were quite cheap. And as it has been stated earlier, the ordinary people used to have rice and ghee at least once a day. With these few words, we come to the proprietorship of the land. The 16th century European travelers stated, followed by a large number of European travelers in the 17th and 18th century, that king is the owner of all land. This was more or less explained very clearly by François Barnier, the mid-17th century French traveler, who linked it with Oriental despotism. But Abul Fazal does not give any such idea. According to Abul Fazal, who wrote in 1596 that there is a contract between the king and the peasant. So long the king protects the peasant, or in other words, keeps law and order, the peasant will pay revenue. If the peasant does not pay revenue, then he is liable to be dislodged. But by 1730, it appears that another opinion has already come in. Kazi Muhammad Allah stated that king is the owner of all land. Whether that opinion was already there or whether that opinion came during the, that time, it is difficult to say. But the fact remains that they normally the peasants are not dislodged for a very simple reason that the revenue would fall. Because the land was available in plenty and labor was not so much available. Therefore, it is a limitation on the oppression of the authorities. And the authorities try to see that the peasants do not move out from one place to another. There are references of peasants moving out to other places, and there are references also that these peasants were ordered to bring back to their native villages. If the peasant does not cultivate the land, then the land can be leased out to an outsider or to some other person in the village. But then if the peasant comes back and wants to till the land, the land has to be given to him. So therefore it appears that the peasant has some kind of a right in the village on the land, but how much that is practically done or necessary, that we'll see now. In a village, 
the peasants form the bulk of the population, but they are identified by caste. Generally, the dominating caste of a village is there. We have a document of 1611 in which it has been shown that in central Doab, the dominating castes were there like Jats, Ahis, Rajputs, etc. We have another document, and this time a bigger one, in 1664, written by a man called Nainsi, N-A-I-N-S-I, Bighat E. Daftari in which he had given a village-wise survey of Rajasthan, particularly Marwar. Nainsi had shown that Marwar can be divided into two zones, the northern zone composed of dominating caste villages, and the southern zone is the villages full of ca other castes. All kinds of castes are there. What is important in uh, Nancy's document is that there is practically no reference to any artisan, very rare, and uh, there is no reference absolutely of any Dalit. But we know that these are there as laborers. In the single caste dominated villages, this caste would not allow any outsider to come in. But the village has a particular problem. The problem is that the villagers produce something which would have to be sold outside so that the villagers could pay the revenue. So there is one tendency of a market economy oriented towards the market. And secondly, in contradiction to it, there is the other element that the village must produce those things which are necessary for the inhabitants. That is, there is a question of self-sufficiency of the village. Now in this pulls between one to the other, the village continues to function, often under dominating caste. The villages can be divided into two types. One is Bhayachara or joint village in which there is no one single uh, Jamidar or anyone like this. And it is run by the village panchayat. The second one is the Zamindari village, in which the Zamindar is the supreme. Now in Bhayachari village or joint village, there is the village community about which we will come in a minute. But there is also the question of some chief of the tribe getting laborers from outside and taking them inside the village on the ground that labor is necessary. But we know that whatever the nature of the village, there are people who are not cultivating anything at all. As a matter of fact, they are not touching the plough. For example, the high caste people, the Brahmins, the Rajputs, or the Benyas, the mercantile class, they do not touch it. They get other people to till their land. Now, this kind of uh, different types of people exist in a village and this creates perhaps some problem for the village community. To look at the internal structure of the village, we have now a large number of documents, particularly from the temple establishment of Brindabon. These documents had been found at a later 20th century by Tarapadu Mukherjee, and these had been analyzed and presented by Irfan Habib 
very clearly. We'll see some of these documents, naturally not the total number of documents are many, so we'll see a few of the documents and see the features of the village. There are two documents of 1579 and 1588 in the village of Aritha, which is not very distant from Mathura or Brandabon. In this village document of 1579, some people are selling land. These are kept, the deeds are kept in the Brojo language as also in Persian language, which is done a little bit later. In the Brojo language, they are claiming themselves as Panch Mukaddam. And in the Persian language, they are simply referring themselves as Mukaddam. The, they are selling 238 bigas of land in six plots, five plots of land and one pond, to two Vaishnavas. One is Raghunath Goswami and the other is Jeev Goswami. Both are very well-known Vaishnavas for their writings. Raghunath and Jeev, they actually were Bengalis and they came from Bengal to Brindavan and they had been referred in the Bengali, contemporary Bengali Vaishnav documents. Now, whether they are buying this land for their own private use or for the temples of Brindabon is difficult to say. But what is interesting is that in 1588 documents, the same kind of references are there, punch, not mukaddam this time, and in the Persian document, it is given mukaddam. So the documents are more or less the same with slight differences. Now there are other documents, many other documents of, for example, four persons selling a portion of land. Then there is a document, 13 persons selling a portion of land. Now what is this land they are selling? This is the village waste land, the land which has not been cultivated, but the land which has been there, perhaps for the grazing of the cows and so on and so forth. And the village punch, or in other words, the panchayat in modern terms, they are selling these lands to individuals. Now this panchayat, the word, comes first in the document of 1599, fairly long uh, after these particular dates. But Ponch would suggest Panchayat, and this is the village oligarchy, which controls the village, which controls the peasant, and who sell this land also. They can give lease to other outsiders. For example, there is a document where the punch had given four bigas of land to a boiragi, even lent him, him some money also for constructing a structure. And it is stated in the deed that even if the punch wants to have this land again back, the consent of the boiragi is necessary. That such kind of clause is there, has been confirmed by the Mukaddam of the area in 1641, much later, and the Bairagi continues and his successors continue to be there for a fairly long time. So therefore the Panch or the Panchayat, they control the village wasteland. And there we can see what is the extent of the authority of the, of the panchayat? The panchayat can only sell or give lease to the village wasteland. They have no right 
on the individual land of the peasant cultivated by them. As a matter of fact, there are records when uh, the peasants, two peasants, sold their lands to outsiders without any reference to the panchayat. So therefore, the panchayat has certainly an authority, some kind of control, but there are also limitations. The panchayat can give lease, as had been stated in case of the Bairagi. It can also do other things with the village wasteland, but they can never touch the individual land of the peasant. Now the question comes that what happens to the money that comes in? They sell money or they lease money. Here Abul Fazal said that every village has a patwari. The word perhaps coming from the person who gives patta. Maybe. But in any case, patwari is the accountant of the village. He keeps the register of income and expenditure of the village. But this document, this register, which has not been found, except in some samples, which I'll tell you now, this register is not an official document in the sense that Mughal administration does not rely on such a document. Although the Mughal officials audit this income and expenditure, here is the peculiar role of the state. The state acknowledges the Patwari and acknowledges his function, the keeping of income and expenditure, audits his book, Bahi, Kagaz Ka Bahi, but does not accept the income and expenditure as stated by him. So there is a ambiguous role of the state so far as the village community in concern and we'll see more. In the time of Adanseb, we have certain manuals, actually three manuals of revenue which had been found. These revenue manuals give the idea of the income and expenditure of the village. Now from this, one can see that the principal income of the village community comes from the share given by the peasant to the village community. Every peasant or a person has to give a certain share which forms the financial pool of the village community itself. The amount of share depends on the size of the family of the peasant as also the size of the land that he holds, which is not uni uniform. And with this money that is there, the village community can lend money, for example, to Boiragi as they had done, or even buy seeds, even give loan to the peasants. So various things can be done on this. Now the principal expenditure of the village community often comes in the loan given to the peasants, but in certain cases, to pay the revenue, the village community has to take the loan from the Mahajan. And in one case, it has been seen that three-fourths of the revenue has been paid by the Mahajan as loan, 
and the village community is repaying him, not at one time, but in installments. So there is a large amount that goes in this. The other expenditure was that the, from this financial pool, the village officials get some money. For example, the carpenter or the leather worker or others who do the village work of the village. For example, making a dam to a nala, repairing the pots of the Persian wheel, repairing the Persian wheel itself. All this, these people had to be paid. So it is not a free or begari, as one says, but an exchange, exchange of services with the money, but sometimes with land. As we'll see shortly, that some of these are village officials get free land. And these are recorded also. They are given particular names to it, particularly in Maharashtra and so on and so forth. So therefore the village community itself has a financial pool supervised by the Patwari so far as accounting is concerned but mainly run by the Mukaddam or the headman. And he gets a remuneration in return. In one case, in the early 18th century, we know how much is the division between the village community and the individual peasant. In early 18th century, there was one Benirai, a punch, that is one of the panchayat leaders, sold land for rupees 72. Out of this rupees 72, 61 was taken by the village community and the rest belonged to him. It is not clear whether Benirai sold the land of the village or he sold some of his own lands or some land of the village. That is not very clear. But it is certain that there is a division and the principal part is taken by the village community. So therefore, there is a right of the peasant, there is a limitation of the right of the peasant, there is the right of the village community, and there is a limitation of the right of the village community also. The village communities in the Mughal period has been very ably described by Father Montserrat, a Jesuit priest who was describing the village community in Salset, that is in Goa, island. He said that there were 66 villages. Out of these 66 villages, 12 villages constitute the village community, the panchayat. From each 12 villages, two persons are given to the panchayat. And these two persons, they constitute of the, of the 12, that is 24 persons, constitute the village community and they decide everything for 66 villages. There is a writer in that, he who writes and so on. They distribute the revenue among the villages. The village then distributes it among the peasants. And if there is no harvest, even then, the revenue has to be paid, which is different from the Mughal system. Now, in case of the payment of revenue in the absence of harvest, the other village communities come forward and they pay, pay it, obviously, as a matter of loan. Now, this is what is the village oligarchy. Now, the village oligarchy itself it appears from the Vrindavan records. Some of the families had been traced in genealogical order that the post is hereditary. 
it is of course one person of a family who is a panch that is who is a member of the panchayat but it is recorded also that in case this one man gets the perquisites or privileges of the panch he must share it with the other brothers now in case of the composition often there are muslims in it actually in a village community of 14 it has been seen that there were three muslims in certain cases the muqaddam was a muslim there is one bari khan who was a muqaddam and who was known so therefore the composition of the village community is certainly hereditary but it is of one family and it consists of both hindus and the muslim peasants not necessarily only hindus or only muslims now in case of this uh, village community the principal problem was the share of the revenue to be give, distributed to the peasant now aurangzeb has a farman in 1666 to rashik das karori in gujarat in which he says that the revenue official must find out the holding of the land of the peasant how much revenue has been asked to pay and how much he is paying whether that was actually done it is difficult to say but it seems that the village community distributes the revenue among its panchayat members and the government likes to have a look at it although whether they did so in all villages is difficult to say and almost impossible but in certain cases they must have seen some of these documents from the patwaris and actual enquiries so therefore the village community has certain rights and has certain limitations of the rights but the peasant also has its right the village community once again cannot touch the individual holding of the peasant but they can always always give pressure to the peasants 